today we're going to talk about why make disciples. So when you think of the question, why make disciples, what kind of answers come up in your mind? Jen. To bring God glory. Yep. Yep. Oh, we got mics. Forgot about those things. Um, so Jen says to bring God glory. Anyone else? Pastor Michael? How about you? you say it. I'll, I'll just repeat it. Amen. Yeah, men do not naturally follow God. They need to be exhorted, encouraged, admonished, right? Nikita. Amen. Um, God has a, um, so Nikita said, God has a um, an ultimate plan of redemption, right? The, he, he redeems us and he brings us into his fold. Where, um, um, so he has a he has a, a long view purpose for discipleship. Any other any other um, reasons of why we make disciples, Ms. Sharma? Oh, I got the mic mic for you this time. Obedience and obedience to the commission. Amen. Obedience because he says so, right? Like he tells us to do it. Anyone else? Anya. Mike is coming. Put you on a workout program, Tyler. Come on, man. This is from the Vine Project. Mm -hmm. uh, that the Lord, kind of like what you guys were saying, the Lord is moving the whole of history in a certain direction. Yeah. And that is to to prepare people while they're here, the ones that He will save, to worship Him in, uh, in glory. And so, <clears throat> um, we have to help one another know how to do it and do it here because that's the ultimate plan of God to prepare us for that. Amen. Amen. So we're going to touch on each of those answers. We're going to touch on each of those answers. And first we're going to look at the fact that he commands it, right? So let's look at Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20. When we talk about discipleship, isn't this one of the first first passages you think about when you think of discipleship? Would anyone like to read that for me? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Robinson, would you mind reading? Thank you, brother. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commended you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. So, so first, Jesus here in verse 18, he appeals to his resurrection authority, right? He explains that all authority has been given to him. This is the risen Christ speaking. He's about to ascend into heaven. This is his last message. And he, he's saying, I'm the boss. Everything, everything is mine. What I say goes. And I'm giving you this last command before I go. So he's establishing that he wants us to make disciples. Now, when you think of... Like we talked earlier, the first question I asked you was why we make disciples, right? Um, we, we mentioned redemption. We mentioned um, God's plan. Um, he, he's moving history um, towards this grand future in heaven. But let's say God didn't tell us about all of those things, right? Let's say he didn't reveal as many details about his plan as he already did. Wouldn't it be enough? If he just commanded us to do it and said, just go and do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, anyone who has kids, you know this concept, right? Um, in my in my house, um, for a while, me, like uh, me and my wife, we would, um, uh, we would we would tell our kids to do things, and we noticed this trend forming in our home where we'd tell them to do something, and before they went and did what we told them to do, they they would stand there and ask us a, a few questions why they they we wanted them to do it. So for a while we were suckered. We would sit there and explain to them 
you know, it's like, hey, so-and-so, go do the dishes. Well, why do you want the dishes done today, you know? Why do I have to do it now? Why can't I do it at 1 o'clock, you know? And after a while, you, you, you give them the picture, no, I, I told you to do the dishes. How about you ask me why on the way to washing the dishes, right? So the same concept applies here. He commands us to do something. We ought to do it. So in this passage here, what, what details do we see about making disciples? What can we see in this passage of what it entails to make a disciple? Claudia. To go. I'm sorry? To go. To go. Yeah, amen. To go, right? Um, we, are to, we are to go outside of where we are. We're, go, we're to find other people. You can't make disciples if no one's coming in, right? You can't uh, teach anyone and admonish anyone who isn't here. You have to go. You have to preach the gospel. And preaching the gospel is the entry point to discipleship. Uh, Noel. They are to be baptized. That's part of making a disciple. Amen. They're to be baptized into the church, right? They're, they're to join our fold. They're to commit fully. Uh, Nikita. Nikita. Oh, my bad. Was a hand over there? My bad. Disciples are of all the nations? Yeah, so, so we're to make disciples of all nations, all people groups, right? Uh, Re Rebecca. Oh, I was going to, um, my thing with baptism too, how it's a church ordinance. So to baptize someone, you're bringing them um, into a covenant relationship with the church. So there's the emphasis on the local church in a life of disciple making. Amen. Amen. So this isn't like a parachurch ministry. This isn't something where, like, um, this isn't like a rogue Bible study that you're doing on your own, right? This is, this is under the authority of your local church. Amen. Uh, Pete. We are to teach them everything that God has commanded them to do and uh, also all of the, you know, different things that we do in church and uh, how to worship God uh, in a holy and, and a way which would give him glory. Amen. So we're to teach them, right? So it's, it's not, um, discipleship isn't... Um, simply let's go let's go play basketball together right nothing wrong with basketball right but um we're to teach them to obey all that christ has commanded so you have all of these details about discipleship that come together in this passage um what promises does he does he give us here nikita he says i am with you always even to the end of the age Amen. Amen. Isn't that encouraging? Right? You ever, um, you, um, you ever, you ever felt afraid to go out and evangelize or to um, talk to a brother or a sister about their sin or to teach someone? Um, and this promise that the Lord is with you is very encouraging. I know some of you, including myself, have been very encouraged by this this particular passage in regards to that. Uh, I saw, was it Ron, was it your hand that I saw? Was it Noel? All these hands. Oh, Troy, Troy. Um, it's clear that um, God is commanding and he's giving us all the ability to do it. So everybody who's regenerate has this ability. So it's not something that is limited. And the scripture makes it very clear if I say that either I don't have that ability or I don't, that's not who I am, then that's going contrary to God's word because he's telling us that he gives everybody the ability um, to do this. Amen. Yeah, and that's going to be my next question. I want to touch on that. So is this command just for the 11 disciples or is this for everyone? Noah? It is for everyone. Yes. And how do we know? It says some here in verse 17, the very, the very tail end, mm -hmm. but some doubted. Yep. Uh, also, if you look at Acts chapter 1, when they are selecting apostles, 
he says that from the men who were among them um, until the time of Jesus Christ's ascension, which included more than the 11, the uh, Acts chapter 1 teaches us that it was more than the 11 here. There were others. And from those, from those men, an apostle was to be selected. So there were more than just the 11 here. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, there's two points. There's two points that, that we know that this is for everyone. One, we, there's, there's evidence in the text that there's more people here than just the 11. It's not that um, Christ was just speaking to 11 people at this particular time. He was speaking to a larger gathering of disciples. Um, the other thing is, when you think about this command, right, he tells them to teach others everything that he has commanded them. And what is his last commandment? To make disciples, right? So he's telling his disciples to teach them everything I've commanded you, including this last one, to make disciples. So it's going to trickle down. It's going to trickle down. So every disciple is called to make disciples. Also, he said, even to the end of the age, uh, which means that's us. Amen. Amen. The age didn't end a few years after that, did it? <laughs> Brother, uh, Keith. I was going to say, even just the thought of making the disciple implies that the disciple is going to do something and just keep on going and making more disciples. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, Pete. And in uh, verse 20, the... Uh, word you okay is carried on down through the generations to apply to everybody who has been saved by christ he says i commanded you and that's all disciples forever yeah that is all people yeah so it is a command right it's a command that we're all to follow this is for all of us we are to um we're to go um, that involves evangelism we're to um we're to to baptize people into the local church all those who would willingly repent and believe the gospel and were to teach them. Well, hand up there. Yeah. Um, also in verse 20 where it says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Um, you know, this, this shows a couple things that, number one, you can't do it, you know, just in your own strength. It's, uh, you know, you have, you have to rely on God to enable you to do this. Mm -hmm. And then furthermore, on the last point, I am with you always. It's not like these are just for the 12 disciples and then, okay, well, always means always. It's not like when they're done, then Christ is no longer with you. Yeah, it's like where did it go? So, yeah. yeah. And Tyler. Also, I think it's important um, when Christ says, I am with you, that um, promise isn't only limited to the apostles in the disciple, in the, um, in the context of um, God sending messengers, because he said the same thing to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, when he was going to send him back to Egypt yeah. uh, to speak to Pharaoh, and he said the same thing to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, when Jeremiah said, I'm too young, God said, I'm with you. Um, and he says it to his other, um, he, he says it to um, believers all throughout the Bible in the context of um, speaking on God's behalf. Amen. Amen. The great Emmanuel, right? God with us. Amen. So like, um, so let's, 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 um, let's, let's also consider a few things about discipleship, okay? Um, I, I know in our church we, we belabor this point a lot, um, but I want to be very clear. Um, when we look throughout the Gospels, and we look throughout, well, we look throughout the entire New Testament. Is a disciple a special stage of Christian? Is that like a, someone who's reached a certain level? Right? No, that's every Christian, right? What's it, uh, Acts 11, 25, what the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, right? So every Christian is a disciple. Every disciple is a Christian. Um, if you're a Christian, you're a disciple. If you claim to be a Christian, but you're not a disciple, um, then then you're not a Christian, right? Um, a disciple is someone who is a learning follower of Jesus Christ. We look at the pattern throughout the Gospels, and what do we see the disciples doing? 
We see them following Christ everywhere. We see that they've left their old lives. They've given up all, all that they had to follow him. They're willing to die to follow him. Um, the call to discipleship is a call to whatever Christ would have happen to your life. So you can't, you can't hold on to your old life and say, I'm a disciple. A genuine disciple has given all to follow Christ. He lives life with an open hand. Let's God put anything into his hand that God wants to, and let's God take anything away, right? So, so why is it important, before we get to the whole grand purpose, why is it important that we consider that God, just the fact that God commands this for us? Why is it important? That's not a trick question. Pete? Well, first of all, uh, he's confident that we're capable of doing it. Otherwise, he wouldn't command us to do it. We've got the Holy Spirit, and he can help us uh, along the way when we're talking to people. Yeah, amen, amen. Noel? Why is it important that we consider that this... Um, that this is commanded to us before we get to the grand purpose all of the whys why is it important that we consider that this is a command to solidify or establish uh, his his authority over us and our submission to him I, I believe that would be why amen it puts us in our place doesn't it it, it um, uh, this isn't just um, God gives us motivations to obey Him. He does very wonderful, kind, gracious, loving things for us, right? But at the same time, He commands these things. So um, we don't just do them because of the, the why in the end. We also do it because he's, he's, our, he's our Lord, He's our Master, He's our authority. It's a both hands. So it's very important that we, when we think of when we think of discipleship, that it's in our minds. It's not like um, it's not a decision I make um, because of what makes me happy about our blessed hope, um, but it's also something that He commands me to do. Okay, so, um, but He also has this great purpose that we talked about in the beginning, right? So let's go to Titus chapter two. And it would help if I can find Titus in my own Bible. Page 994, thank you. It's actually page um, 1380. (laughs) So, Titus chapter 2. And I would like someone to read... All of chapter 2 for me. Can someone do that? Daunting task? Noel. Thank you. ESV? Yeah, I like that. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, turning us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, 
and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Amen. Thank you. So, um, so, do you see discipleship in this passage? Yeah? Where do you see discipleship in this passage, Claudia? That to uh, teach the older men are to teach the younger. Yep, yep, men, yep. And the older women to teach their uh, younger women to um, uh, be self-controlled, take care of their home, and be submissive to their own husbands. Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah, so you have the older teaching the younger, right? The more mature teaching the less mature. Any others? Um, Andy. In verse 1 of chapter 2, um, we see that uh, doctrine was um, intended to be taught. So you have obviously, like, you know, older wise people are to communicate um, through the medium of, like, speaking, right, teaching doctrine. So um, it, it wasn't the idea of... Um, Doctrine wasn't meant to be like we're, we're supposed to just kind of be in, our, in a cave by ourselves, but there's a way in which that God said we're going to communicate this information verbally to other people. It's one of the one of the ways that God would uh, communicate doctrine to us. Amen, amen. So we have sound doctrine being taught, Brother Michael. I don't know if you're going to go go here, but um, <clears throat> discipleship is not just teaching too, right? Mm -hmm. Discipleship is also modeling. And um, not male modeling or anything like that, but yeah. but like being an example. I have example. a lot of experience with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but like being an example, right? And so, um, to, you know, in, in making disciples, is we teach um, others what Christ has commanded, right? Teach them to obey. Um, but we also model that. We also obey and live live lives of godliness. And so in... Um, in Titus chapter 2, um, older men are to be. Amen. You know, they yeah. are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. And older women, right, likewise, are to be, right? They're to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine, right? So th you see discipleship in the fact that they're also commanded to obey what Christ has commanded and to be examples and ex exemplary to those they are teaching the good doctrine too. Amen. Yeah, thank you. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. I meant to mention that earlier. When we talk about what a disciple is, a disciple isn't someone who just ingests a bunch of knowledge for their own benefit, right? A disciple is expected to live out the knowledge that they've ingested. Um, and when you look at the way that Jesus modeled his discipleship, he didn't just tell the disciples what to do. What did he do? He modeled it in front of them, didn't he? So when the disciples themselves, you're reading the book of Acts, the, disciples, um, the, the apostles were little Christs, weren't they? Going out all the, around, all the way around, preaching the gospel, teaching, um, and, um, and there was that trickle-down effect we were talking about. Amen? So, Anya. And then also in verse 15, all of this is reiterated to Titus himself. So um, <clears throat> discipleship is not only what uh, people in the pews do. It all starts yeah. with what we hear in from the pulpit. Uh, it says, speak these things, all of these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So in a life of a healthy church, all of this is kind of like all... <laughs> yeah. Connected with one another. Preaching isn't just this one thing, and then discipleship, discipleship is this some other thing. It's all uh, coming down from the pulpit to us here, and we we'll all do the same thing. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's to be. It's um. <laughs> and he said he said exhort everyone with that with all authority, right? 
um, uh, um, there's no plan around, right? Um, so, um, so let's look at um, in verse 11 through 14. Um, he says, for the grace of God has appeared. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. In verses 1 through 10, so we see this picture of discipleship, right? And just like Anya mentioned, we see in verse 15 how um, this, this, this comes from the top down. This is, from, this, is, this is something everyone is expected to do. But he gives us a why in verse 11. So you say, do all of these things, Paul. Why? Why do I do them? For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So why? In verse 14, he redeemed us. And he, he did that so, so, that we would be, so that we would be made pure and that um, we, would, we would be Christ's possession for eternity that's the reason why that's the motivation that he gives um, Titus here to disciple and to command the folks in his church to disciple because we're looking forward to a day where we're going to be with Christ his own special possession redeemed people worshiping him in spirit and in truth so we're commanded these things, but there's an ultimate umbrella of a purpose on top of it. And it's very glorious, isn't it? Right? I mean, um, I, um, we'll get to a few other passages, but it is, it is very glorious to think of that. And that should, when you think about discipleship, doesn't that change some of your view about discipleship, if you haven't considered that before? About um, being Christ's possession? And this reason that um, you're to be a part of a group of redeemed people um, for him, worshiping him, it gives you a reason um, to, to look around the church and to find who you can help, who you can teach. It gives you a reason to go out and preach the gospel. It's more than just about you at that point, isn't it? Right? Pete. And uh, I like the last sentence in verse 15. It says, let no one disregard you. <clears throat> He's not teaching us to disrespect him, but to be bold and perseverant with the gospel. Not to shy away, you know, just because somebody's getting upset or, you know, just do it in love. But do it with uh, uh, knowledge and, and foresight about what you're doing. Yeah, amen. Amen. That glorious picture is worth being staunch about the gospel, isn't it? Yeah. Andy? I was just thinking, as we're, as you, to your point, what you just mentioned prior, um, like why discipleship, and I was thinking, um, in light of us studying end times and just considering what that's going to be like, um, mm -hmm. in verse, um, the end of verse 12, when he says you know, that we should live righteously and godly in this present age, because Christ is coming. You know, Amen. Why, Amen. why disciple now? Because Christ is coming; He's going to return. Because, um, because of eternity and being with the Lord, and so, you know, we all want to be there. We all want to um, encourage and bolster up one another because that time is coming. Amen. Amen. And speaking of speaking of the second coming, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter five. And would someone read for me verses 1 through 22? Another long passage. Dorian. 1 through 22? Yeah. First Thessalonians 5? Yep. 
Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, excuse me, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through Lord through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. <clears throat> but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, and do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Amen. Thank you, brother. So he flips it here, right? He flips it. So this time he gives us the purpose, the, the motivation, before he gives us the, the, the discipleship command. So where in this passage do we see this, this great why we're talking about, this motivation, this plan for redemption? Andy? He says it in the very beginning of the chapter, um, looking at verse 2, he, he says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord um, so comes as a thief in the night. And so he kind of gives the reason. So um, so why why disciple? Why ought we to be ready? Because, um, because again, Christ is going to return. You know, and he kind of makes the contrast, like those... Um, those who are sleeping, um, they're ignorant of these things. It's going to come upon them, and they're going to be completely shocked, off guard, you know. Mm -hmm. But we are, you know, the command to us is to kind of know the times. We're, we're taught about Scripture to um, to understand when we see these things, to know what they are. Um, and so in light of that, be ready, prepare, disciple, grow. Yeah, amen. Amen. And Noel, you had something too? Oh, what, Rebecca, let's go Rebecca first. She's right there. I'm trying to save your legs, man. Uh, starting in verse 9, it says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Amen. So it talks about, like, what Nikita was saying, that end purpose, that we're going to be um, with God in Christ, um, in glory, worshiping him for all eternity. And then verse 11, you know, in light of these things, therefore, you know, we were given the command um, to encourage one another and build one another, build up one another, just as you also are doing. So we see the command for discipleship, for encouraging, for persevering one another. You know, it's a collective um, work. Um, and the reason is from the verses before that we're going to be with Christ. We're going to live together with him being redeemed from our sins. Amen. Amen. So we're looking. We have obtained the salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're looking forward to his coming. Not the way the, the, the rest of the world, they ought to fear his coming. Oh, oh Noel's next, by the way. Um, but um, but uh, we look forward to it. We have obtained the salvation and we're going to live with him. We're going to be with him. And we're going to be his redeemed people, worshiping him for eternity. Brother. 
I was just going to say what was already said. So. Gotcha. And Nikita, you had something too? Or did I see a hand? Stroke on the hair. It's all good. So, <laughs> so, um, so, um, so yeah, so we have this great motivation, right, in the beginning of the chapter. And then he moves on, um, just like uh, Rebecca, um, she, she pointed out the shifts. He gives, he gives us the therefore in verse 11. Um, so this is why we want to build one another up. This is why we want to encourage one another. What do we see in the, the remaining verses through verse 22 about discipleship? Don't everyone raise their hands at once. I'm reluctant to call on you. On you. Yeah, it's, you got to check your privilege, man. You know, no privilege. I'm joking. <laughs> so, <clears throat> among other things, I see that there are different kinds of discipleship depending on <clears throat> the person you're discipling. Amen. In verse 14, oh, there are the unruly and they need the warning. There are the faint-hearted, and they need the comfort. And there are the weak, they need to uh, be upheld. But all of these groups need patience uh, on the part of the disciple. Amen. Amen. So he gives us different categories of people, right? Different categories of people who, um, who need help, right? The weak need to be strengthened. The, um, the, the idle they need to be admonished. Those who are deliberately disobedient, right? Um, the faint-hearted need to be encouraged. Uh, Noel? In verse 14, and we urge you, brothers, plural. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, an elite group that do this. Amen. It's a command to all of the people of God to do this. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. But, you know, like, um, I would suspect, right, like for um, uh, someone who just became a brother, someone who just got converted, they might be thinking, well, I, I can't, I can't do all of this, you know? Like, I don't know anything. Like, I don't, I don't even know, like, how to find, you know, Titus in my Bible, you know? I have to look in the table of contents, you know? Um, I, 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 I can't understand the book of Job. You know, <laughs> right? Um, um, but even a new brother can do these things, can't he? Right? I remember there's, there's a, a specific brother in my mind. Um, uh, I remember when he got converted, um, did, didn't know much of anything. But, I mean, this brother, he always had his Bible with him. And he, he, he would give me a call every once in a while to encourage me. He, he didn't know what to encourage me about. <laughs> You know, <laughs> except to obey the Lord. <laughs> you know, he would, um, uh, every time he learned something, and you know when you convert, when you first convert, you're always learning something, right? Um, uh, he would learn something, he'd go and try to teach it to someone. He'd ask all these questions about evangelism. Um, and this brother was extremely encouraging, and he'd just gotten converted. He didn't know anything, right? And, and what he was doing was discipleship as best he could with the gifting that he had, with the abilities that he had. Andy. I was just thinking about my own experience whenever I got converted and like feeling that inadequacy of like going to people. And one brother had um, kind of just shared with me a way that you can also, in addition to what you're saying, um, kind of disciple is like when someone comes to you as a new believer and they're you know teaching you exhorting you whatever the case is to be receptive right to be Amen. humble and like absorb that information um trusting god and so like that way you know one you're encouraging the brother in your um receptiveness to the word of god and you know it just it's going to be for your benefit you know yeah. and so over time that information that you are you know storing up in you you'll be able to pour out into others you know, so Amen. instead of being kind of hard-hearted and, um, or maybe not necessarily hard-hearted, but just, you know, being a little bit um, difficult, you know, that, that can be a temptation, you know, Amen. And, yeah. um, in pride. But instead, just intentionally as you're, someone's coming and rebuking you, like intentionally humble yourself, be thinking about it, you know, and that's a way to encourage the person that's speaking to you. Amen. Amen. Let's go Rebecca. 
Yeah, just to bring out um, scripture to Andy's point, like starting in verse 12, it says, um, it gives us the command of how we're to respond. You know, we're to have the heart of appreciate, you know, appreciate those who are diligently, diligently labor among you and have charge over you. So we're to appreciate them. We're going to, we have to have a certain like heart disposition towards them and it's to be appreciative. Amen. Um, that you esteem them highly in love because of their work. You know, um, we're to love them and to esteem them highly for um, the charge that they have over us and the instruction that they're giving us. So we see the commands of how we're to um, disciple people and how we're to respond when we're being discipled, to Andy's point. Amen. Amen. We're not only to disciple, but we're to be good disciples, right? Amen. Praise God. So let's, real quickly, let's run to Revelation 7. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. Because I really like this picture. Verse 9. Just to give you guys a last glimpse of what we're looking forward to in heaven. So, verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation... From all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on a throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So don't you look forward to that great day. You will stand with the great multitude. You'll be able to look out and you will see scores of people worshiping Christ, right? It'll make our worship services look like, you know, duck, duck, goose. You know, just like a, some cheesy kids game. Right, um, we will we will worship the glorified Christ, um, uh, the Lamb who was slain for us, and He will be glorified amidst the redeemed people. Um, and by God's grace, you will see people whom you have discipled, people whom you have spent time with, um, people who you have prayed for, people who have discipled you, and you will all be looking to that one person. And worshiping him um, that's a motivation isn't it yeah so think about it think about it um, right now I want to get some answers so considering that right considering that motivation what are you going to be willing what what should we be willing to give up to make disciples Andy We should be willing to give up earthly pursuits because mm -hmm. we're going to be living for eternity, right? Not for the here and now only. Amen. Amen. Our, our hopes and dreams we'll, we'll gladly bring um, as an offering. I'm butchering that line to the yeah. Pete. We need to set aside pride and uh, be humble because uh, we're to set an example for those to whom we are uh, teaching uh, what they're supposed to do. So if you're not humble, then you're going to be uh, misrepresenting what the Bible says. 
Amen. Amen. We need to be humble. We need to, we need to put aside our own, um, our, our egos, right? Um, someone over there? Nikki? A Roland? Time. Time. Definitely time. Time. Definitely the sacrifice time. Yeah. Amen. But I, I uh, wanted to ask a question. What are what would be some um, wrong views of discipleship? You know, I've uh, heard uh, those that have been here for a while and come to group, and mm-hmm. then you hear, I haven't been discipled. Nobody discipled me. Nobody's. Yeah. Me. So, what would be some wrong views of discipleship? I know we just have. I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah, we like we have a minute left. Like, um, like, so um, we have to be very careful when we think of discipleship. Not to reduce it down um, to a, a select few things. Um, for instance, um, if I said um, discipleship is spending one on one time with one person in the church um, for a particular length of time, that's discipleship. Or discipleship is just taking someone out for evangelism. That's discipleship. Can discipleship involve those things? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And in many cases it should, right? But we see models of that in Scripture. But is that all discipleship is? No. You see examples in this. You see um, one on many discipleship, right? Um, we, we, we get this, this, this time right now is a time of discipleship. When we're here listening to the sermon is a time of discipleship. Um, there's one on few, right? Small group is discipleship time. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Like we, um, and we could unpack that even more. We could have a whole lesson on that, right? Um, wrong views on discipleship. We also have to have to be very careful not to expand discipleship past the bounds of scripture, right? So we have to be careful not to say, well, yeah, you know, we went and played basketball and I was teaching this guy, you know, my meanest crossover, you know, and um, we're going to show him all that Christians are real cool, you know, that's not discipleship, right? So, um, but yeah, so we need to be willing to give up time. We need to be willing to give up money. We need to be willing to give up whatever it takes to see our brothers and our sisters sanctified, um, to help them. Because we want to see Christ glorified amidst a redeemed people, do we not? Right? So um, let's. Oh, oh, Pastor Michael. Yes, let's please. Yes, please. Sorry, I didn't realize you were trying to wrap it up. But, no, you're fine. Um, we need, like, using Scripture, you know, Hebrews chapter 12 says we ought to lay aside every sin. You know, yeah, and and the weight, and weight yeah. which so easily ensnares us. So things that could be very lawful for us to uh, give our time, our money, you know, yeah. uh, to um, we ought to be ready to to lay those things aside when they hinder us in running the race. Amen. We, we need to give up. We definitely need to give up sin, but we need to be willing to give up even good things, good helpful things sometimes. Um, for a better purpose, a better cause, which is our, our the sanctification of our brothers is a better cause than many of these nice things we experience, right? Um, whether it be a trip to Disney or, you know, um, a few extra hours on Facebook, right? Um, we need to be willing to give things up. So um, so be prayerful. I want to exhort you to, to think through um, making disciples. We've only gotten through so much today. But think through the why of making disciples. Think through the purpose of why we're here. I hope that this informs how you walk into the church, how you live out the rest of the day today, how you think about small group, how you think about corporate evangelism. It, sh- it should cause you to think differently about um, how you go through the various functions in the church and how you relate to your brother. Okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, um, I I pray that your people um, are edified. Lord, I'm very thankful that in your word you give us so many um, scriptures about discipleship. You've put in place, Lord, a means for us all to be sanctified together. And you've given us this great, wonderful um, uh, reason 
to see um, our brothers um, sanctified and to go and to reach out to the lost. And we thank you so much for this, Lord. Lord, I pray that my brothers and sisters and myself, Lord, would be very faithful um, in making disciples and in being good disciples. And Lord, I also pray that you would um, bless the rest of our day, too, um, as we be, as we are being discipled even today. Um, so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.